Ballad of Orange and Grape. After you finish your work, after you do your day, after you've read your reading, after you've written your say, you go down the street to the hot dog stand, one block down and across the way, on a blistering afternoon in East Harlem in the 20th century. Most of the windows are boarded up. The rats run out of a sack. Sticking out of the crummy garage, one shiny long Cadillac. At the glass door of the drug addiction center, a man who would like to break your back. But here's a brown woman with a little girl dressed in rose and pink, too. Frankfurters, frankfurters, sizzle on the steel where the hot dog man leans. Nothing else on the counter but the usual two machines, the grape one empty and the orange one empty. I face him in between. A black boy comes along, looks at the hot dogs, goes on walking. I watch the man as he stands and pours in the familiar shape, bright purple in the one marked orange, orange in the one marked grape, the grape drink in the machine marked orange, an orange drink in the grape. Just the one word, large and clear, unmistakable, on each machine. I ask him, how can we go on reading and make sense out of what we read? How can they write and believe what they're writing, the young ones across the street, while you go on pouring grape into orange and orange into the one marked grape? How are we going to believe what we read and we write and we hear and we say and we do? He looks at the two machines and he smiles and he shrugs and smiles and pours again. It could be violence and nonviolence. It could be white and black, women and men. It could be war and peace or any binary system, love and hate, enemy, friend, yes and no, be and not be, what we do and what we don't do. On a corner in East Harlem, garbage, reading, a deep smile, rape, forgetfulness, a hot street of murder, misery, withered hope. A man keeps pouring grape into orange, and orange into the one marked grape, pouring orange into grape and grape into orange forever. Anne Sexton once said of Muriel Rukeyser that she is, quote, the mother of everyone. Teacher, war protester, journalist, pilot, mother, defender of children's rights, and writer, Muriel Rukeyser saw her life as encompassing all of these calls. In an early essay she wrote as a young poet, she said, quote, to live as a poet, a woman, American, and a Jew, this chalks in my position. If the four come together in one person, each strengthens the other. Rukeyser was a social activist and a poet known for her commitment to underdogs and injustices. In the 1930s, she attended Vassar College and became literary editor of the leftist undergraduate journal, Student Review. As a reporter for the journal, Rukeyser covered Scottsboro trial in Alabama, in which nine black young men were accused of raping two white girls. According to Wolfgang Saxon in his New York Times obituary of Rukeyser, the Scottsboro incident was the basis of her poem, The Trial, and may have been, quote, the genesis of her commitment to the cause of the underdog and the unjustly condemned. Many of Rukeyser's poems, particularly after her first few collections, were very personal, speaking on her role as a mother and daughter, speaking on sexuality, on creativity, on the poetic process, and also about illness and death. Her nine poems to an unborn child weave meditations about being pregnant into observations about the state of the world in the mid 1940s, this world that the child will be born into. As one critic wrote of the poet, quote, Vintage Rukeyser is so easy as to appear simplistic. Whether or not we concur in her desire to offer the unborn a vision, a blueprint for the future, 
we can respect her sense of life's possibilities and her fiery commitment to the poem as polemic. Rukeyser's earlier poems often centered on a single theme, but developed in, as one reviewer put it, separate autonomous bits and varied in line length and stanza form, the parts of each rolling towards the reader in a series of waves, each of which crashes firmly. Later, Rukeyser moved towards more concrete images and shorter poems, and this coincided rather closely with her increased devotion to the personal as well as to the political. Now, while Rukeyser was read and admired in the 30s and 40s, that is a time when she did receive numerous honors. But after World War II, she kind of fell out of favor for a variety of reasons. By the early 1970s, she began getting a lot of new admirers, such as Alice Walker, who in the clip that follows discusses Rukeyser's work and her poetic vision. I don't have a poem to read by Muriel because the poem that I most love, I know by heart. And it's very short. And I kept it on my wall for many years. And it goes like this. For God's sake, they are connected underneath. People think islands are separate like them. I met Muriel at Sarah Lawrence in 1963. She had suffered a stroke. I didn't know this. Of course, I didn't know her either. There was this large, handsome, forceful woman, but also a little strange because of the stroke, I now understand. And we all just accepted her strangeness as being a little zen. She was very different from most people. She, she spoke sometimes in poetry. Uh, and that was lovely, but it was also so different, you know. Her primary teaching about poetry was to help us understand why people resist it and why they fear it. First of all, they really don't want to encounter any depth in themselves. You know, that to go really deep in yourself means that many people who were uh, open to poetry ended up in, in, in lunatic asylums because you, you risk a kind of madness if you begin to actually feel uh, what you understand. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are so many people who could understand it, but they wouldn't dare feel it. That's the hope, that's the faith, that people don't have to stay asleep, they don't have to stay afraid, and poets are notorious for, you know, storming the Bastille, you know, they're out there making that effort. And Muriel was one of the giants in that way. She was in politics, she was in the study of science and history. And she was traveling the world, she was writing poems everywhere she went. She was making connections. And it's just possible that, you know, uh, it's because of poets like Muriel that some people do survive as whole. And you would want that for a society, for a culture. <laughs>